Just wanted to tell that we wanted the students to give a few short words, a few te short testimonies of their experience at camp and how they grew with God through that process. So, without further ado, I'm going to move this way to that way. Okay, so I wrote down what I was going to say because uh, when I get up here in front of a lot of the pe people, I forget what I have to say. So <laughs> um, I wrote this out last night and this morning um, as I was going through my notes and stuff from camp. So I'm just going to read what I wrote. Uh, <laughs> I wrote, I had an amazing opportunity to go to Snowbird this summer with our youth group by the grace of God. It is a trip I will never forget in growing with every person in this youth group, talking with camp counselors, having one-on-one -on -one conversations with our leaders. My eyes have been open to so many things. A sermon or what they called like a breakout session that we had there, um, the, their keyboard player, um, her name was, they call her Moose. Um, she did a breakout session with just the girls, and that was probably um, my favorite part of the whole camp. And um, that really put weight on my heart um, when she was talking about idolatry. And she actually went through the whole group of girls in there and asked them, like, what's something that y'all struggle with? What's something that is on y'all's heart that you um, have difficulty dealing with? And so it was cool to me that she started off her sermon um, asking the crowd what they wanted to talk about. So it wasn't like I knew she came in there and like already had planned out what she was going to say. Like she wanted to talk about what we wanted to talk about. So that was really good. Um, so she taught the girls specifically um, what we stress over and battle and with being attentive and engaged all week I came to the realization that body image um, and health has become an idol and has been an idol for me for the past couple of months and this really broke my heart because I can't put my appearance and what I eat over my salvation and when not focusing and prioritizing my walk with the Lord, I know now that idols don't work even when you reach your ideal goal. Um, an idol is something that we look to to give us what only God can provide, and it can also be something or someone that we love or serve in place of God. Um, I've learned that I have been way too set on like working out and eating only super healthy foods that it's like all that lives in my thoughts now, and I've been desiring my body image to be how I want instead of loving, 
appreciating, accepting, and guarding my body as it is because I'm exactly who God has made me to be. And I look the way I do because God created me fearfully and wonderfully. Any earthly desire or temporary source of happiness will let you down and leave you feeling just as empty. This idol has caused me to not be as faithful and obedient to God as I should be in his word. And this is the biggest mistake any of us could make in life, is putting anything or anyone before God. My soul has been tired for a while because I was lacking time with the Lord for a while and felt stuck. But in Luke 12, 22, it says, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you eat, nor about your body or what you put on. And worry won't add a single hour to the span of your life. Through prayer and time in the word, I'm refusing to wallow in um, self-pity and actively looking to God being my sovereign and good father. Jesus tells us to get up and walk in John 5, 8. Activated faith is still possible with a broken body, and what isn't possible with man is possible with God. Confidence isn't in ourselves, but in God, and, and he will grant us victory. I'm choosing to worship God ahead and during this battle. Instead of letting a number on a scale be my identity, I want my radical obedience to God to be my identity. I don't want to know or wonder God's plan, or I don't have to know or wonder about God's plan. God doesn't comfort us by showing us our future. He shows us himself. And there's no condemnation. We are free from bondage. God has granted freedom to those who receive him. And God works all things for his good of those who love him. And I'm getting my eyes off of what my flesh is after and setting my mind on things above. I learned that desires of the flesh deceive you and we have to find a deeper and greater desire because when running from sin and brokenness you have to be running towards something greater and a faith that saves is a faith that finishes and I could never defeat the enemy alone but Jesus's death burial and resurrection has set us free and because of Jesus I no longer have to be a slave to sin so Snowbird was life-changing and I can't wait to go back next year and I'm just so happy that I got to do it with these people. So I also wrote down what I was going to say. So at Snowbird, I was privileged to go, like, to begin with, because most camps were closed. And I was privileged to hear the biblically-based sermons that were so amazing. And all of them touched my heart, so it was really hard to choose what to talk about. So I picked a few. <laughs> so um, idolatry uh, opened my eyes to what I'd been putting above God. I'd been putting my body image and sports and, most importantly, screen time on my phone. Um, I gave my insecurities to God and prayed, um, and I had to reprioritize what I had been focusing on. Um, one of the counselors named Mofred, um, well, that was her nickname, uh, she told us how she had dealt with screen time. She had given a password on her phone to limit how much time you spend on your phone. And so Audrey and I have now given each other passwords to each other's phone that we don't have to hold each other accountable and to hopefully create good habits where one day we won't have to do that. Um, idolatry doesn't work, though, is what I learned. Um, because you can't quench your spiritual thirst with physical water. Um, I've become aware that not training for godliness is training for sin, just because you're not um, technically doing anything bad. If you're not growing in your relationship with God, you are training to sin against him. And, uh, and one of the most important things I learned, and it gave me hope, was what God or Jesus Christ said before he was crucified, um, the word telestai, and it means it is finished. But they told us about how it meant a long time ago that whenever you owed someone money and you couldn't pay them back, that you had to work for them. So once you finished working that time off, you would go and get your documents, and they would stamp the word telestai, and it means paid in full. So you no longer have to worry about or try and pay God back for um, the mistakes and sins that you've made because Jesus is sufficient. 
you no longer have to feel like you owe him anything because we are free from bondage and condemnation. And Snowbird really deepened my desire to know him and allowed me to flee from what was holding me back. I did not write this down, so. Um, okay. Okay. So, um, Snowbird, uh, all camps are closed, and like we were, God uh, gave us the luck, I guess, not luck, but He gave us the opportunity to go to a camp that was very amazing to go to. And uh, they all had to wear masks, but no matter what, even if they had to wear masks, at least we got to learn God and learn more. I honestly don't care what we got to do. So my favorite thing about the camp was the preaching because uh, he's like the kind of preacher who was like preach stuff and like go off like topic and like say something about like his time, like life and, uh, and how he was like, like raised and stuff like that. And the way he like preached just made it a lot more easier and not complicated at all. Like it made me, it made it easier for me to learn and he would just like, like make it like kind of funny and stuff like that. So, and when we had like small groups, that was like little groups where we would talk about like that day and what we learned in the preaching. And uh, the dude we had was named Colt. And you could, a you could ask him anything. He would, a he would answer you immediately about the word and God and, so I, I, I had like an hour or two just talking to him, like just us, and he helped me, like, he's like, he asked, I asked him how, where I was as a Christian, and he like told me from like, just from knowing me for a week and how much of a Christian I was, and like, he helped me out so that he made me look at like what I need to fix as a Christian and what I need to start doing and to be a better Christian than what I already am, and he had told me that I just need to, don't think too much. Just do what, like, just try thinking what God would do and then just try to do it. And so I've just been doing that, you know, just thinking about, like, oh, yeah, would God do that? No, he wouldn't. So I'm not going to do that. And so I'm going to try to be, like, less as a sinner than I was, but, like, I wasn't that much of a sinner. But, but we're, I mean, we all are perfect, so. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to talk about our cabin, so, so. Yes, so Friday, okay, we were going to put somebody on a picnic table while I was asleep. Uh, we were going to bring them out to the snack shack. So Jason said it was okay. We were going to get, <laughs> these were our choices right here, but we, we didn't, get... Bruce didn't want us to do it, so he told us to go to bed because, yeah, he, he said it was okay, so we were going to do it. <laughs> and then Bruce... And then, and then Bruce had told us that he put somebody on a roof when he was a teenager, so. <laughs> that was very inspiring to us. So we were, we were trying to go ex more extreme than pick the table, but no, nah, he wanted us to go to bed because he only got like two hours of sleep. So back, so back to like the testimonies and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was very inspirational to me because the, the preacher was uh, Brody and I like how he preaches, like, it's just, like, really, like, straight up, and he tells you, like, about God and about how good he is to us, and we had breakout sessions, like, after the preaching, somebody else would, like, teach, like, something other than, like, the preaching was, and one was about, like, man of God, so, like, all the girls had left, and it was just all the guys in there, and he was telling us how to be men of Christian, like, like, Christian men, and he was, like, saying that, we have to like let go of all the unlike childish things and not be a child anymore. Like try to be in a man. So, like I'm I'm doing that now. Like I'm trying to not like act like a child. Like be like a man of Christ and do manly things. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think I'm done now. Snowbird 2020 was like a huge thing this year for me. It's one of the biggest things that, that tribe has ever done and since I've joined. And I think every tribe person in this room, even the youth leaders, could say that we all grew more together than we already were because this brought us all together. We were all in the same room. We hung out with each other. And I'm going to speak of one of the biggest things they did was they took our phones and 
that's the best thing they probably did that whole trip. <laughs> I look around at the whole camp, people with their phones, they're sitting down, they're not looking, like, they're not looking at anything around them. There's mountains, there's nature, anything you could do, walk around, go hiking, but they were just on their phones, and you could do that at home, you could do that anywhere, but, like, why there whenever you had so much other things to do? Um, they're, like, the preaching thing, you had three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon. Our preacher was named Brody. He was very, like, relatable to, like, teenagers and stuff. And, like, he could talk to us, and we could talk to him. And that same thing goes with our um, leaders that we had back at camp. You could talk to them anytime you felt like. Like, if they, you just find them walking around doing stuff, you could just ask them, like, hey, can we talk? And they'll always be there for you. I had to, like, Nathan said he had Colt. Colt was, we had three leaders. Colt was, like, the high school leader, and then we had Luke and Joseph. He was the middle school leaders. They were awesome. Like, um, Joseph was, like, 19, and Luke was, like, 20, or in his early 20s. But we would meet up after our groups at nighttime, and we would just talk about, like, whatever we learned. And one thing that Brody said that kind of stood out is about sin, like, you can fight sin, but not only fight sin, but it's always okay to run away from it. Stay away from sins and stay loyal to God. They did a revelation skit, and that revelation skit was very, like, good acting. It was very, like, realistic, and it kind of made me learn, like, that's what could possibly, that, that's what will happen one day. <laughs> that's going to happen. And the people that were the slaves to um, Satan, they stayed loyal no matter what. They were three seconds away from death, but they didn't, they didn't change. They didn't go to Satan's ways. They stayed loyal to God, and that's whenever he came in and later then resurrected them. And um, it was just an amazing experience, the whole thing. And personally, I loved it so much. There were so many activities and things we could do, and... Everyone's just so nice. And like Nathan said, that whole putting them out in the picnic table, Friday night, I was scared. I did not want to wake. Well, not only did they say I was going to wake up on a picnic table, they were thinking about putting me in the creek. So, like, I didn't want to wake up floating down a creek. So I was like, touch, don't touch my mattress. And then, like, so me and Roy were, like, the only people asleep, and that's why they were going to go for us. But Josh didn't set his alarm. <laughs> So that ended up never happening. They were planning that for like four days straight. Never happened. So overall, the camp experience was amazing. It was wonderful. I loved it so much. It brought everybody together. We just had so much fun, laughs, and everything, you know? Okay. So I'm going to go off of what Braden kind of said because I was kind of thinking – Sort of the same thing, because, like, Brody, the preacher, he kind of, like, he reminded me of Pastor David because he could, like, he could, like, go off topic and make you laugh. (laughs) 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 But he could also bring you to the Lord, and you would know what he's saying. So, like, when he spoke the word, like, he didn't, like, joke around with it. He, like you knew he meant something. And like the small groups that we had, they were awesome because we had two of the best leaders, I think, because like you could go to them, ask them something, and they would be like, they would tell you straight up. So they went pick around, they would like tell you. And uh, our cabin smelled like dead people. Like honestly, straight up, dead people. <laughs> and dirty clothes. And also with, with Braden said the revelation skit that also showed me how powerful Christ is because like the devil's people were like there was like a 30 of them it seemed like there was only like five of the angels and Christ and they just wiped them out and it was pretty cool to watch that okay so um I'm gonna start off by saying our cabin didn't smell like dead people Um, And we were not going to put anybody in the creek or anywhere near the snack shack. I'm sorry to let y'all down about that. (laughs) We wanted to sleep. Um, So going into the snowbird camp, I really didn't think 
that I was going to get a lot out of it. And I know that sounds bad to say, but I didn't feel like I was going to get as much as I did. Um, it was really a life-changing experiment, ex experiment, wow, experience. And um, I think my real turning point was the third day they were there, they talked about relationships the whole day. And not with just the relationship with my boyfriend, my, I mean, it's everybody, my friends, my family. I had come to realize that I had not put God above anybody. He was always second. Um, I also began to realize that I was only a weekend Christian. And it broke my heart to hear and, like, come to that realization. Um, that night in the cabin, I think it was just me and Sierra because everybody else was in the second room playing cards or something. <laughs> um, me and her just had a conversation, and she slowly fell asleep. And I just sat there, and I went through my notes. Um, and just going through the notes and reading from the three days we've been here, I realized that this experience was something that I feel like a bunch of people should have experienced. Um, it's something that God speaks to you through, um, especially the leaders that we had. You had that sense of security with them that you could talk to them anytime that you wanted to. You found them on campus, boom, you could have a conversation and they wouldn't care. Um, Friday night, our last group that we had, I talked to the leaders and I asked them, I said, how do I know to become a better Christian and how do I focus on becoming a better Christian? Um, they told me that they struggled themselves becoming a better Christian because it's not easy. When you're at camp, you have this thing called a Christian high. You have church every day, twice a day. You're sur constantly surrounded by Christians. When you get to the outside world, people try to tear you down for being a Christian. And that's when you have to stand up and say, no, I'm going to follow Christ. This is where I need to be. And I had that realization. And I've pretty much deleted all my social media now to get away from the negativity. Um, I've, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a pretty hard step because you want to see what's going on in the world. But when you're trying to follow Christ, that just tears you back down. And you don't need it. I mean, the only time I get on Facebook now, maybe, is when my mom's on it and I'm looking to see what my family is doing. Because I don't live with some of my family, obviously. They live in Texas and everything like that. But this experience has really drawn me closer to God. And I cannot thank all of y'all enough for giving us the opportunity to go. And thankful for the leaders and everything for letting us go and giving us this life-changing experience. My disclaimer is, I told them, <laughs> everything has to be fixed in the exact same place that it was. And two, the person that is getting pranked, can they laugh about it afterwards? That was the stipulation. It wasn't just Jason was okay with it. All right, all right. Of course you didn't. I find that my boys had selective hearing. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for just the opportunity to hear what you do, to hear about what you do in people's lives, to hear about what and how you desire to use our life to impact this world, to bring light, to be salt, to bring flavor and zest and energy and truth into a world that is begging and groaning for it. I look at the riots. I look at all these things that are happening across the world, politics aside. Romans says it best, the world is groaning for something. Father, it is groaning for you. And so I pray that we take that seriously. Father, give us, this, give us the wisdom to know that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. I pray that we get close to you today. We worship you in truth and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord.
Amen. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Altars open, folks, if you want to come up. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. All days you give us, Father, are, are beautiful. We thank you, Lord, for what has happened here this morning already. The worship of your name and song. The worship of your name and testimony. We praise you, Father, for these young people who got to experience this. We thank you, Lord, for their safe return. We thank you, Lord, for their leadership. We thank you, Lord, for this camp that they were able to go to to learn more about you in their lives, Father. Thank you, Lord, for being here in this place with us today. 
We thank you for this church, and we, we thank you for our pastors. We thank you, Father, for who you are. Now be with us, God, as we learn more about you through our pastor. Be with him in a mighty and a special way. We ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Good morning, kiddos. Miss Stephanie is in an undisclosed location. We need to take one more week off from the time machine. You see, the time-traveling watchers are hot on our trail. They protect the speed force in the timeline. And let's be honest, we've been hopping around a lot lately. But don't worry, we will be right back at it next week. But this week, I have a parable for you. A parable is, is a simple story that Jesus would tell that would teach us lessons. So we're going to travel to the book of Luke, chapter 15, and start verse 3. So he told them this parable. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. And coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. Now, it doesn't mean that Jesus and God don't love us because we're true believers. No, it just means that he longs for the heart of all of us because he knows what our hearts can truly be and our purpose in him. He loves everyone equally. He sent his son, Jesus, to die for all of us, no matter our differences or the way that we look. No, and it is up to us as believers to humble ourselves, to be ready to take this incredible example and never stop pursuing those who need to hear the gospel and the love of Christ. He loves us and this is my challenge to you. Go out, never stop pursuing and live your purpose because he loves us all equally. Love you guys. I hope you have an amazing rest of your Sunday. Thank you, Miss Stephanie, for that wonderful message. He loves us all. How? You listened. That's good. He loves us all equally. Um, I've written my notes down. <laughs> so I don't go off topic. Um, you know, we, we, this is first service, so after we finish, we'll load up and leave, and the next crowd will come in, so we can't just stay all day, so I, you know, I will be aware of our time, and, uh, it's not like you haven't heard any message yet so far, is that correct? I think you probably heard enough to get you going, and inspired and motivated. I'm, I'm so glad to see a lot of our kids are coming back, there's a whole row of them here, and and I know, I know this isn't kid men, I know that, but uh, here's the thing. Thanks for coming and, and bringing the family. Those of you with kids that are, under, that are under middle school, that's what they've got to look forward to in this church. That's where we want them to go. That's where we want our energy. And thank you for giving financially, church, generously. This is why. This is... It's not just a, a legalistic, well, I better put my... No, this is why we tithe and give offerings to the church. Because, see, there, this, was a, this is not a cheap camp. All of those events, are, are, they cost money. You go to an amusement park and do all that and see how much you're going to spend. So we had plans for three or four fundraisers this spring to help our kids raise the money. Guess what happened when the virus hit? No fundraisers. So... The church, we look, we're going to take care of our kids. That's priority. I want you to know that. That's important to me. And you see why. So thank you. I'm inspired by our leaders and our teenagers. Um, 
if you are interested in Sarah fundraiser, see uh, Cecil, wherever Cecil is. He has these to help us raise money for Sarah. And also, if you don't have this, as you leave, I want you to get this. This is next Sunday. We want to honor you. Next Sunday is, is July 5th, July 4th weekend. It's going to be our patriotic service. So wear your red, white, and blue, and we're going to honor our law enforcement, medics, EMTs, firefighters, and we're going to ask them to come, and we're going to honor them and feed them lunch and give them some, some respect that they greatly are due. So take one of these. Take several and invite people. Invite those that serve us. Thank you. Okay, Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Jesus loves us equally. Um, I, I, tr I try not, I don't, like to, I don't like to preach about topics. And you know I've, I've shared that. Uh, next Sunday we'll do patriotic message on freedom. And then after that we'll get back into our series. We're going to do Paul. We're going to do the Apostle Paul. We're going to tell the story of his life and study about Paul. It's going to be a great study. But today, I want to talk about who do you think you are? Now, there's two things I want you to think about. You know, these teenagers talked about their self-image. Who do you think you are? That's a big deal. Do you think that you are inadequate or overweight or, or not athletic or you have blemishes? Or do you think that you are who Jesus thinks you are? And, and then the other side of that is, have you ever had anyone say to you, who do you think you are? You ever heard anybody say that to you? How does that make you feel? Not very good, does it? Who do you think you are, little freshman? Who do you think you are coming up here taking my spot? Who do you think you are sitting in my pew? Who do you think you are parking in my spot? We're going to see what Jesus thinks about that today. Because he had a lot to say. Uh, really, kind of our, our, our theme today is impartiality. Before we read in Luke, let me go over to the book of James, chapter 3, and read two verses to you. James, this is James, chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, if you want to check that out. But the wisdom that is from above, wisdom, which we should all be passionate about, being wise in God's eyes and gaining wisdom that is from above, that is not earthly wisdom, heavenly wisdom is from above, is first pure. Important word. Especially when we think about our relationship with others and how we think about others and respect or disrespect others. Wisdom from above is pure, and it's then it's peaceable. Well, you know what? You ever feel like, boy, I need to, somebody needs to put that person in their place. Guess what? They don't need any help. Their actions and their words identify who they are. Those who are violent. Wisdom from above is pure and peaceable and gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits. Watch the next two words. Without partiality. And without hypocrisy. That's wisdom. And the fruit of the righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Okay, Luke chapter 5. Today we're going to study others' opinions of us, and we're going to study our opinion of ourselves and how we're supposed to treat that and feel about that and look at that. We're going to look for truth where it is found, and that is in God's Word. And for an introduction, I want to tell you a story. A story that perhaps you have read or heard about when you were a child. It's called The Prince and the Pauper. You may have ever heard that story? You probably, oh yeah, I don't remember what it's about, but I remember. Okay, let me explain it to you. The Prince and the Pauper. 
this is a fiction, and it teaches us some important truths. It was about a prince named Edward, Prince Edward, who trades places with a pauper named Tom. A pauper is a very poor person, a street person, a beggar, a vagrant. So we have a prince and a pauper. Both wanted something the other had. You see, the prince wanted to be free from all of his responsibilities. It was heavy being a prince. He felt responsibilities. It was heavy. It was hard. And he would see the pauper who was just sitting there doing nothing. Free. No responsibilities. The prince wanted to be free from his stress. The pauper, (laughs) he wanted what the prince had, which was wealth. The story goes on, and they soon discovered, however, that both princes and paupers have problems. It's kind of the grass is greener syndrome. Since no one knows that Edward really is a prince, guess how he was treated? Now, when they knew that Edward was a prince, he was treated like a prince. But when he wasn't a prince, he was treated like a normal nobody. Hmm. They treated him rudely and even cruel. In the story, eventually the two switch back to their original positions. Edward, the prince, says this, I have learned the value of mercy. And you shall be a better subject, for you have learned to understand the burdens of your king. People naturally are partial. We are. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. No, I'm... Yeah, you are. And let me... You probably treat your boss a little differently than somebody who's not your boss. Because we're partial. What did the prince learn? He learned that people treat you differently when you are a pauper than a prince. Wow. This is called partiality. Favoritism toward others because of wealth or fame or anything. If, I don't know, I'm trying to, if Michael Jordan walked in, I I don't know who to use here. If Michael Jordan walked in, he would probably be treated differently than if someone who was nobody who nobody knew or cared about. Because he has status. He is somebody. That's how we are. There's a new kid in school. Every year this happens. And some kids are cool. And so they get treated like cool kids get treated. And some new kids aren't cool. Maybe they're nerds or maybe they don't have the right kind of shoes. or So they get treated that way because we're partial. Christ demonstrated, and the Bible teaches that showing favoritism or preference can cause serious problems. So Christ wants us to avoid playing favorites, being partial, having prejudices because or towards someone who is not like you. Christ has a message. Luke chapter 5, listen, verse 27. And after these things he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said to him, 
Two words. Jesus says to this, you might know what a publican is. He's a not popular money guy, corporate guy, tax collector. He takes your money. He takes money that you've worked hard for, and he takes it to the government, and he keeps some of it for himself. That's a bad guy. Well, Jesus goes and sees this guy named Levi, and he says something to him. Jesus said, you're a crook. Why are you? That's not what he said. Is that what he said? Why are you taking it? You're a rotten guy. You're a rat. You know what Jesus said? Two words. Follow me. What would you have said? You have some choice words for these crooks. Jesus had choice words too. He said, follow me. That's all. That's all. And he left all, Levi. This was incredible because nobody expected this to happen from this rich guy in, in his business. Nobody expected this to happen. He left all and rose up and followed Jesus. He left his money. He left his status. He left his Cadillac chariot. He left all that to follow Jesus. Woo. And they were all amazed. Yeah. Levi made him a great feast in his own house. He was rich. He had rich friends. So he called this big feast. And he had all his rich friends to come. And he made a, had a party in his house. And there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. So here's this big house of rich people who were crooks. And they didn't get, they weren't liked. And Jesus shows up to their party. Okay, what happened next? Getting interesting. But the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious people, the churchy people. Okay, here's this big house party with rich people. And Jesus went to the party. And the scribes and the Pharisees, it's verse 30. They murmured. Now, I know y'all church people. I know y'all don't ever murmur. <gasps> Look at that. Can you believe? I can't believe what they're wearing. Can you? That's what church people do. We murmur. Instead of saying, Wow, Jesus is hanging out with all them rich people we don't like. That's awesome. No, they murmured. Wow. They murmured against his disciples saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Well, I never. No, you never. And Jesus answering, I love it because Jesus doesn't use a lot of words, but his words are so meaningful. You have all heard this. And here's where it came from. They that are whole need not a doctor. But they that are sick. How many of y'all get up and say, boy, I feel so good today. This is a beautiful day. I feel so good, I'm going to go see my doctor. No, that's not where you want to go. That's not how on my list of places I want to visit today. You know why? Because you're not sick. But boy, when you're sick, whew, I got to get in. Doc, I, got, I need to see that I am, I got to have help. Y'all get this? Do you get it? They that are whole don't need a doctor. Do you think the publicans and the sinners needed a doctor? They needed the great physician. His name was Jesus. I came not to call the righteous, 
but sinners who repented. That's the words of Jesus. All right, I'm going to hurry because I'm supposed to be done real quick. So listen fast. Christ had many friends and followers. Acquaintances. How did he treat them? Young, old, rich, poor, male, female. Should I go further? Black, white, brown, green. Thank you. In honor of Ronnie, I got to bless him. Jesus treated him all the same. Jesus never played favorites on any basis. Point number one. Let's look at this. There's a contrast. There's a big contrast. Matthew, the tax collector, and Simon. First of all, we see the calling of Levi, Matthew. In view of many Jews, Matthew, a tax collector who became one of Jesus' disciples, had been disloyal to his country. He was a traitor. He had betrayed. He decided to work for the enemy. The government, the Romans, that's like the Russians. When I was growing up, everything was the Russians' fault. That's a bunch of... And I'm not sure it wasn't right, but that wasn't the point. He would have also been hated because of his dishonest practices. He was a bad guy. Yet Jesus called him. He said, follow me. I want you to hang out with me. With amazing promptness, Levi left all, rose up and followed Christ. That's what they told our kids at camp this week. Follow Christ. Take a stand. Say no to some stuff and some people and say yes to God. Follow Christ. This is a choice we all have to make. Jesus is calling you today. Follow me. Jesus is saying that to you right now. Oh, but I'll go to church. Forget that. Follow me. You can sit in church all your life and not be a follower of Christ. Just because you sit in a garage don't make you a car. He's calling you. I don't care how many Sundays. Mm. I got to stay on track. <laughs> Think of all the consequences that followed his decision to follow Christ. What would his friends think? How about some peer pressure there? You think? He made a choice. Matthew became the writer of the first gospel. That's him. This crook, rotten, tax collector, he wrote the... That's what Jesus does. It pays to hear his call. And it pays to say yes. Here's Simon. I want you to look at Simon. The zealot. Simon had been a member of a group of political fighters. He was fiercely loyal to his country and his cause. He would even kill the bad guys, the Roman soldiers, if he had a chance. Matthew. Simon. Opposite poles. Yet, they came together to follow Christ. Is that a message our world needs today? Or do we murmur about all the YouTube videos? Both men from opposite worlds followed Christ. And became his disciples on the same team. That's what the love of Jesus does. Only Jesus' love can do that. 
He turned these enemies into comrades and teammates, and he put them in a bunker together. That's what the love of Jesus does. After Matthew and Simon became disciples, which one did Jesus prefer? Well, neither. Both. Because Jesus don't play that. Now, I, watch this. This is important. History is important to us, right? I've heard that so much lately. I love history. I think history is important. I want to be close to my heritage and my legacy. But, not so much with Jesus. Because you see, you didn't have to sit down and tell Jesus about your great granddaddy. Because Jesus don't care about your history. Because Matthew's history wasn't good. So Jesus said, and so often Jesus upsets our theology. Because we want to say, well, let's go look, let's look at the history. Do you know what Jesus would say? Forget the history. You're lost. Follow me. I don't care your history. I don't care. I don't care what your pedigree is. I don't care. I love you. He was impartial. What's in the past, boy, I know this is not popular. What's in the past is in the past. And Jesus said, it's under the blood. Let's start today. Mm. They had similar powers and responsibilities. It didn't matter to Jesus what a man's job was before he followed Christ. didn't matter. Or where he came from. Many of the disciples were fishermen. All but one came from Galilee, the northern part of Palestine. One exception, Judas. He may have been from Judea, the southern part. It didn't matter to Jesus because he just said, follow me. Come on, guys. I don't care. I don't care what color. I don't care where you're from. I don't care. I don't care what your daddy did. Follow me. Start over. He, all he wanted was obedient, willing servants who loved God above all else. Christ did not show favoritism toward his friends who had a better religious background than others. Andrew, one of the 12 disciples, was a disciple of John the Baptist. Listen, listen to this contrast. Andrew was a disciple of John. Oh, Andrew knew the law. He was there with John the Baptist. He was right there. He was a... How about, let me show you about this disciple of Christ. Her name was Mary Magdalene. You ever heard of her? How about her past? How about her pedigree? Okay. Well, first of all, she was a woman. <gasps> a woman disciple? Yes! She followed Christ! So you can forget all of that stuff about men went. she ministered to Christ and the disciples a passionate follower a disciple of Christ oh what about her past she had been possessed by seven demons not the Sunday school girl oh she was a prostitute But it didn't matter because she followed Christ. It didn't matter she didn't grow up in Sunday school. She followed Christ. Didn't matter. Yet she witnessed the crucifixion and became one of the first persons to see the resurrected Christ. Andrew had a strong spiritual pedigree. Mary had none. She had no clue. But she was sick, and she needed the great physician. And he said, follow me, and she did. Number two, the criticism. First of all, the contrast. Secondly, the criticism. Murmuring, the scribes and Pharisees criticized Jesus for associating with such despised people, dregs of society. It screams to me pride and arrogance and piety. Because, see, history was important to them. Who do you think you are? To 
criticism. They criticized Jesus. Number three, the correction. Here's Jesus' response. I just read it. His actions were in perfect accord with his purpose in coming into the world. Healthy people do not need a doctor. Only those who are sick. Folks, lost people need a Savior. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what side of the street they live on. Don't care what kind of car they drive or what kind of bank account they have. Lost people need a Savior. His name is Jesus. The Pharisees considered themselves to be righteous. They had no deep sense of sin or need. Therefore, they could not benefit from the ministry of the great physician. They didn't need Jesus. He got in their way. He interrupted their religion. But these tax collectors and sinners realized their sickness and their need to be healed. It was for people like them that Jesus Christ, our Savior, came. In conclusion, the Lord set no limits on who could be his followers. The total absence of favoritism, prejudice, is one of Jesus' striking qualities. It was unique. He saw the same lostness and potential in everyone, regardless of their differences. This approach begun by the Son of God and empowered by the Holy Spirit has made Christianity the one great universal faith. Sets them apart from all of them. Because see, you can't earn it. Nothing you can do. All, everything else, you got to do something. It's not restricted by geography, nationality, race, or sex. Our treatment of others should reflect the same impartiality. Never treat a person differently from others because of the way they dress, talk, look, or by the intelligence or bank account. See, all as Christ does, there is no room for partiality or prejudice. Let's bow our heads. Our time is gone. But God's is not. If God has spoken to your heart, the Holy Spirit, you just open your heart to Him. If Jesus has said, follow me, you follow Him today. If Jesus has convicted you, you repent. I'm sorry. I can't sugarcoat this one. Father, we are lost. And we need the physician. Our land is sick. We hurt each other. We hate each other. We fight each other. <laughs> but not Jesus. God, I'm glad you don't care about our past. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your blood. Thank you that you care for sinners like us. God, may we reflect your character today and this week. It's all we can do. And, and God, I pray on behalf of myself and this church. Lord, when you say, follow me, we say, yes, Lord, I follow you next. In Jesus' name I pray.